Hi, um, I'm Bruce Dickinson, and you are watching and or listening uh, to Life Minute podcast or TV or radio. No, not radio. No, that would be so old school. Iron Maiden's Bruce Dickinson leads a colorful life. Besides fronting one of the world's most iconic metal bands, he's also a commercial pilot, flying the band to numerous gigs, a competitive fencer, owns a brewing company, has written films and novels, hosted radio shows, and he's been working for years on a solo project that's also a comic book series called The Mandrake Project. We caught up with him recently at Evergreen Studios in LA to hear all about it and more. This is a Life Minute with the legendary Bruce Dickinson. It's an album and it's a comic slash graphic novel. I mean, you know, it's, if you're a kid, it's a comic. If you're a middle class uh, guy, it's a, it's a graphic novel because I'm grown up and I don't read comics. Right? Yeah, But it's a 12 episode comic. The two things are related, but uh, not joined at the hip, you know, so they're, they're, they're independent, freestanding things. Uh, yet they do share a common culture at the roots and things like that. But the story of the Mandrake Project, the comic, is not reproduced on the album. It's not a literal reproduction of anything like that. So it's not a concept album or any one of those type things with Vincent Price narrating it halfway through and all that. No, it's not. Tell us about the album. The album, for me, sounds surprisingly consistent, as in consistently interesting, which is surprises me even more, considering that it took 25 years to put all these things together. And the, I mean, the last track on the album is the oldest track. It's 25 years old. The one before that is like 20 years old. And then the first two were written last year. I am your very soul, so what you do not know. I am the truth that's playing hide and seek. And then the year before that, I came with a bunch of songs and said, maybe we should do another album. That was 2014. And then the next thing, it's now. And it's like, okay, well, where were we? And we just picked up where we left off, wrote two new songs. And this album actually has been finished for a year. So it's been a bit like a bit frustrating. Uh, it sounds too negative, but it has been frustrating because, you know, you want it to come out because we've done it. It's great. Wow, listen to this, you know. But the ways of the world means it doesn't quite work like that. You know, you have to set the release date. You have to work back. You've got to do the press. And... Because we were really keen on doing uh, double vinyl, that has its own time pressures. Mm -hmm. uh, vinyl is a scarce commodity in terms of acquiring it, getting the numbers you need for the pressings and everything. And that's a whole different cycle of, of things. But the album cover, the single cover, all of that, I wanted to make as like a kind of enigmatic piece of art that people would look at it and handle it and go, what's going on in that picture? And they are pictures, they're not Photoshop. Although we're using all this digital stuff to record things on, it's still a very kind of analog album. And in fact, the stage show, when we, we take the band out, um, people say, well, what's the stage show gonna be like? Because obviously Maiden, you know, we have you know, big scary monsters and big huge things and pyrotechnics and all the rest of it. I said, well, this thing is, it's not back to 1992, it's not back to 1982, it's more like, here we are in 1972, what was going <laughs> on then, you know? Um, but people who've listened to the album, they get that, they go, oh, wow, that's so, so cool. So you mean it's just music? I mean, yes, it's music and everything else, and we, we, we don't have any, like, weird, funny little monsters, you know? <laughs> An eternity has failed, is that the old one you're talking about? The last thing that happened after we, one, finished mixing the album, and two, I got the comic accepted at Z2. The last thing 
I had to do was come up with a title for the record and the comic. So I wanted it the, the same title, that both would share the same title. And I didn't have one. I'd done this whole album, I did not have a title. Well, I did, but I couldn't use it anymore. So the title was originally going to be If Eternity Should Fail. Now, because Maiden used that track, always my intention to kind of repossess the track. But because the story had moved on of the comic, I changed some of the words, I changed some of the, the verse lyric to make it reflect a bit more the story of the comic. And I thought, well, Eternity has failed, which is great. It works with the end of episode one of the comic. But if Eternity should fail, it's kind of out of date now as a, as a title. What the hell am I going to call the record, you know? I mean, If Eternity Should Fail was actually an episode of Doctor Strange. That came from comics in the first place. Mandrake Project as a title uh, came up because I thought, well, what? What do I, what do I want people to have as a reaction? One, if they see that as the title of a comic, and two, if they see something as the title of an album. The one thing I thought about Mandrake Project for the comic is it looks a bit conspiratorial. I quite liked it for that reason. But then when I look, I put the same thing on the record and allied it with the photographs and the, the cover art, it looked and felt like to me that it was a kind of a bit of a puzzle. It was a bit of an enigma. It's like, so you pick it up and go, that's really cool, but what, what is it? There's the perfect way to approach a record. You know, you buy a record, you know exactly what's going to be on it. Why bother? But you, you buy a record and you open it up and go, oh, oh what's this all about? Oh, what's this? Oh, my God, why is he in a graveyard? What's he thinking? And that goes back to when I was a kid and I had, I think everybody did this with it, the very first Black Sabbath album. And there's this amazing photograph that ended up being one of the most enigmatic pictures, I think, in rock and roll history. And people, people stared at that picture for hours going, what is she doing in there? It's just an infrared picture. And I think the, the woman who looks mysterious and she's wearing a cowl, I mean, she was like the tea lady or something. You know what I mean? And they just said, go and stand in that field over there. And, and it all just kind of worked. We had a couple of shots like that that we did. And we did one photo session in one day and got so many great photographs. And uh, one of them was in this, the back cover is like, oh, that's it. And the, the, the centerfold similarly, you know. But I was dead set no Photoshop on okay. any of those <laughs> because it disturbs the, the belief. You know it's fake because you know that bit's obviously fake. And kids can spot that now because they can do this stuff yeah. on their home computers, you know. And your solo work, how is that different from for you? And, you know, why did you want to do this? I can travel to all kinds of different musical universes, obviously all basically within the genre of rock music, but that's a pretty... It's a pretty broad church. I mean, when I was growing up, it was. Now it's narrowed down. If you go to, you know, radio stations, like satellite radio stations and stuff like that, you sort of like, uh, oh, I see there's 150 stations and they're all playing entirely separate categories of music, you know, which I find just kind of annoying uh, because it, it's quite frustrating, actually, in that people have been able to identify and, what's the word, segment different chunks of the audience. For me, the music was growing up was completely the opposite, was that there were no boundaries to, you know, what, what, what you could listen to. So if you wanted to listen to Motorhead one minute and ZZ Top the next and Django Reinhardt the next and then Genesis the next and Jethro Tull, what's the problem with that? There is no problem with that, you know. And the culmination of all that ends up basically being the Mandrake Project. So we know who your inspirations were. You just didn't drop them, I think. Any I dropped a few of them, but my, yeah. I, but no, but you know, you <laughs> could chuck in Deep Purple and, and Arthur Brown and Black Sabbath and Van de Graaff Generator and all these weird ass, but some of the weird ass bands. I was lucky in that the the the, the back end of the sixties, like Hendrix and all that stuff, was very present you know, at the beginning of the 70s. And then the 70s took it to levels of 
technical expertise that people in the 60s couldn't really dream about. And that kind of dovetailed for me with punk because I was at university in the East End of London when punk was going on. I wasn't implacably opposed to punk, but I saw it as being uh, more of an art school type thing than a musical thing. I get why it's a look and it's kind of a musical look as well. But beyond that, beyond one album, where does it go? And the answer is it, it can't go anywhere because, you know, musicians want to progress with music. Punks were not interested in particularly progressing with, with music. So it didn't take long for, for the music industry to subvert itself, you know, um, and get back down to it. But I was always like into rock music. Rock music has never thought of itself as a, a, collectively as a group of fans or bands. We, it's never thought of itself as being pop, pop as in ephemeral pop, as in disposable. It's like we're always, we're always all of us looking for, always looking for eternity. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Did you always know you wanted to be a musician? No, I had no idea. I mean, when I was a kid, I dreamed about being an astronaut. I, I would have settled for an astronaut, fighter pilot, <laughs> submarine commander tank commander, any of those things, you know, and then uh, didn't get into music really until I was like 13, whatever, when 14. I had a couple of records, but I didn't have, there was no music really in the house. Dad used to play occasionally. I mean, he had some weird, he had some records like Edith Piaf and Frankie Lane. Fra I like Edith Piaf. Both actually, actually now, I mean, it takes you years to overcome ignorance and prejudice, you know, and so there I am listening to Edith Piaf going, she's actually really cool, yeah. you know. And funnily enough, as is Frankie Lane, you know, because he does some, he did some great stuff. I mean, Free Ten to Yuma is, is a classic, you know, I mean, the film soundtrack track, but it's the original Free Ten to Yuma song is sung by Frankie Lane, I think. And it's brilliant, you know, and he's kind of a precursor to that whole Johnny Cash thing, which again was something I came to later realizing, you know, just what a genius he was. It sounds weird for a heavy metal singer to say, but unplug your prejudices and, you know, leave your ego at the door and go, this is great. When did you realize you had this voice? When I got fired from being a drummer in my band. I wanted to be a drummer, you know, I mean, because I was one of these kids that was always bouncing off the wall. I mean, these days I would probably, they'd, took one, they'd take one look at me and they'd like medicate me at birth, right? <laughs> I decided that, that, that drums was the way to go because it was a physical instrument. You were banging and clattering and making a lot of noise and, and stuff like that. But the logistics <laughs> of carrying a drum kit around, I thought that's a pain in the ass. So I started out on bongos. I like, borrowed a pair of bongos from the, the school music room and we had this little kind of band of a couple of guitar players and a bass player and me on the bongos. We were massacring Let It Be by the Beatles on bongos. And the guy that was the singer, he allocated himself the job because he was in the school choir, but he had a bass voice. And so he got to the chorus and he, he couldn't do it. It was like, <laughs> you know, like that. And they said, shut up on the bongos. You're giving us a headache. Your hands are starting to bleed. And anyway, so give him a hand with the vocal, you know. I was like, yeah. How's it go? He goes up, let it be, yeah. Let it be, yeah. Let it be. I said, should I be writing this down? You know, <laughs> and he said, yes. And, said, and, and then let me guess, let it be. He said, no, whisper words of wisdom, let it be. And, and two things happened at that point. I thought, this is like simple shit. I mean, if you can write stuff like this and make millions, why be a drummer? Be a singer, man, you know? So I had a go and boom, it, they, they went, oh, you're the singer. And then we went downstairs and we split up artistic differences, you know? And then, and then I got kicked out of that school and turned up to another school, which was where I, near where I lived. It was a boarding school I got kicked out of. And How I went, old were you? Uh, I was like uh, 17, I was 17. And so I'm, I'm 17 years old and I'm at this other school, which is like a regular school. It's just like a regular type high school type school. In my class were these uh, uh, three or four guys at the back 
and they're chatting away. And I hear this voice going, we haven't got a singer for the rehearsal tonight. What are we going to do? Because he's quit. Oh my God, no singer. And I went, oh, shall I? Oh, shall I? Oh, oh, oh. Oh. And I said, I sing a bit. They went, really? I went, yeah. Well, you're in then. <laughs> I mean, that was it. I mean, I mean, it properly was a garage band. We played it, they played in their father's garage. We did that. We did two gigs in total in our career. Yeah, so we did a couple of shows uh, in pubs. And then I went to university. Um, and then I got a bill from the tax man for the two shows because we'd changed on with the, the, the band's name initially was um, Paradox. I went, that's a terrible name. No, you need something epic, you know. I said, what about Sticks? They went, Sticks? He goes, Is, isn't there another band called Sticks? I went, they won't mind. <laughs> Yeah, so Sticks. But what had happened was was that the real band Sticks had come into town and done some shows in the UK, at like town halls and things like that, um, and obviously left. And somebody had gone. There was some money. Where where are Sticks based? And somebody went. Oh, look! Here's a band called Sticks. They come from Sheffield. <laughs> and my parents got the bill of like about 2,000 bucks for Sticks, the big American <laughs> band. So that they Crazy. we kind of, we did, well, obviously we sorted that out, but it was oh. funny, man. I mean, so yeah. And then, yeah, I was at university and I started a band with some friends and we did a few more gigs. I was getting quite serious at this point. So we're doing that. And then I, I moved around and joined another band um, and finally got headhunted out of that band into joining a band called Samson, who had an album deal, and I recorded my first album with them. I did two albums with them, um, arguably two, well, two studio albums, but completely with them. And then out of that, I got headhunted into Iron Maiden, you know? Amazing. What did your parents think of all that? My dad was a bit weird about, about music. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think he was secretly, you know, quite, you know, quite proud of it by the time I got to Maiden. But of course, I never told anybody that I was going to be in a, a rock and roll band. I just lied. I went, oh, I'm going to go to a university in London to go and study history because it might be useful. But I had no intention of doing that. You know, um, in fact, the, the college tried to ch throw me out twice mm -hmm. for not doing any work, you know. So you dropped out? No, I threatened to sue them and I stayed in. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was just complete. I can't believe I did that. I, I mean, I don't know how you did. Back in the day, it was they were so frightened of the student union and they had lawyers and everything else like that. And I had two things against me, two strikes against me. One is that they alleged I'd done no work, which was true. Um, and the other one um, was that I hadn't paid any rent, which was also <laughs> true, because I had a grant from the government to go to college. And I spent all of the grant buying a PA system for my band. Um, so I just used to hide uh, when the rent man came around. So I, I owed all this back rent. They said, uh, we're going to throw you out for academic insufficiency and non-payment of rent. So I went, hang on a minute. That's two separate departments there. And you're putting it all in the same letter. Is this a conspiracy? Uh, you know, you are conspiring against me. It's, you can't do that. You can't throw somebody out of an academic institution. You can take them to court and say, I want the money. But you can't get thrown out for not paying rent. And you put those two things together, what it looks like is that you're out to get me. So I get the lawyer on and you don't want that. You don't want all that bad publicity, do you? Oh, my God. And so, so smart. <laughs> so I, I had six long essays that I had to do about whatever it was, Spanish Civil War or something, you know. I did them in two weeks, but I stayed in. Amazing. I stayed in. I was just like, you know, I said, it's at the end of the second year. I'll figure out how to pay the rent. I said, but but the you can't throw me out for that. And in any case, the guy goes, oh, I think you should take a sabbatical for a year. I went, no, I'm not going to do that. Because if I do that, I'll never come back. I said, so I actually i am going to get my degree the same as everybody else, because it's all sit down exams at the end. There was like two weeks of written sit down exams. Uh, so, hey, that's a level playing field. How long after that until you just exploded? About two years. Oh my God. So I, I, I got out of college. I did my final exam in the morning. And then I turned up to rehearse with Samson in the afternoon. And, and that was it. 
I was off, you know, and, and we oh, were, I mean, we, Samson, we, it was, if you're going to make all your mistakes in the music industry, just try and do them in a concentrated space of time. And we did. Mm -hmm. uh, but then out of that, I, you know, had this kind of reputation as a singer and I knew the guys in Maiden because we had links to each other. So the, ba the, the drummer from Samson, Clyde Burr, had left shortly before I joined and joined Iron Maiden. So we were next door to each other in a recording studio and Maiden were doing Killers and we were doing an album called Shock Tactics and we would all go and hang out in the studio bar and ch chat and stuff. But lo and behold, you know, they were having difficulties with their, their first singer. And I was doing a, a festival gig at Reading Festival with, with Samson. <laughs> I mean, festival rumors, all these rumors flying around. Because at the time, I think Rainbow fired Ronnie James Dio. I got a bizarre call. I was in my girlfriend's uh, apartment. The phone rang and it was Richie Blackmore's guitar roadie. And I went, how do you know I was here? He goes, oh, I was a friend of a friend. He said, uh, are you interested in the job? I went, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, and that was the last I heard of it. That was it, you know, and that, that didn't didn't hear anymore, you know. So I would think, well, that was odd, you know, very strange. So anyway, with Maiden, it was different. I got a kind of a interview in, with the, with the manager that night after the festival. Yeah, that's bit of, bit of bit, bit of a bit of a grilling, you know, yeah. and so yeah, and I explained that I would love to be in Maiden, but I was not going to be like the the previous guy, in terms of style, or in terms of opinions, as in. I had a lot of opinions and you either gonna get used to it or you're gonna fire me in the first five minutes. So tell me now, because I can save you the bother of firing me, just do it now. Otherwise, I'm gonna be a pain in the ass, but for all the right reasons. And kind of, that, there you go, lead singer syndrome, you know. <laughs> That's awesome, and the rest is history. Yeah. Oh God, what a story. Creatively, what's the process like for you? And, and everything, Everything I do, whether it's writing the comic script or whether it's writing film stuff or writing treatments for videos, I always look for the story. What, what's, what's the story? Why, why, why are we doing this? You know, and, and I do that with songs as well. People always usually ask the question, you know, ah, oh, so how do you write a song? What, what, what comes first, is it the music or the lyrics? And the truth is it doesn't matter something comes first. It doesn't matter what it is. I mean, it could be a sound, you know, it could be somebody picks up a guitar and just plays some random bog standard chord that everybody plays on the guitar. Something like that. It's just the sound of that particular guitar on that particular day and you suddenly go ding and a little phrase or thing will just pop into your head. And, and then you can conceal your story. You can have fun with it then. Because then you say, we don't have to be obvious in telling this story. It can be, people can have to chip away at it and find out what it's like. So I, I love using allegory if I can. What I aspire to in terms of lyric writing is, yeah, it's got to work as the actual sound of the words that come out of your mouth. You know, that's why they're lyrics. But if you can also tell a story and be poetic, as well as lyrical. There you go, that's the holy grail. You don't always get there. How do you hone your voice? Oh. Undeniable, oof. legendary voice of yours. I wish I could say that there's some magic routine that I do every morning when I get up and, you know, up with a lark and like, I'm like that, but no, you know, my, my voice sounds horrible the same as everybody else's voice sounds horrible first thing in the morning, you know. I did spend a lot of time when I was younger teaching myself things that probably you get taught if you go to a singing teacher. So I just spent a lot of time researching the voice and things. And then I asked a bit of advice from one or two people. 
And then I just tried to emulate, first of all, other voices. And I figured out what voices I could sound like naturally, which I think is what most people do. When, when As soon as you start playing any instrument, you, you imitate people you admire. And if you can imitate somebody you admire and you sound pretty close to them, you think, oh, yes, isn't that great? Actually, it's, in the end, it's not because you actually have to find your own identity. That's the bit that can be troublesome. And actually having a, a technically good voice is an obstacle to that because it's easy to sound like quite a few other people. And therefore, it's difficult to find out who you are. If you have a voice that is restricted in some way, you accommodate that within your style immediately. And therefore, you become very characteristic straight off the bat. So rock music is different in that respect. I had a moment back in, in Samson, funnily enough, and I was working with a producer called Tony Platt, who'd just come off doing the ACDC record, Back in Black, with Mutt Langer producing that. We had all these, we had this material with Samson, and he made me sing what I considered out of my normal range. That's what I did, and it was a bit challenging, but everybody who heard that record went, wow, that's great. You sound like you. <laughs> And I went, like you. I hate sounding like me. Who is that person? They said, that's you. That's your voice. So I learned to be myself on the record and turned it back into being myself live. And then I joined Iron Maiden. And I joined Iron Maiden. And I now had this like palette of voice that I could bring there. And I had all these ideas about what, how, what I could do to really, you know, because it's kind of almost like mock operatic type stuff at this point. And I thought that would be super cool to do that amount of aggression with that kind of like big voice, you know. Um, so that's kind of how the, the concept of me singing with them worked. And your cancer scare, your oh, yeah. survivor, that must have been. That's one of those, uh, oh, really? Okay. Hmm. And the weird thing was, I mean, I just finished an album with it. Yeah. And you didn't know. Oh, I, I kind of did know, um, but I chose not to know yeah. until I finished the record. I was having a little funny little thing. I mean, I wasn't like losing weight or anything else like that, but I just, you know, I was always a tiny little bit sweaty at night. And, and, and I had a lump in the side of my neck, like a, a little one, just like when you get a, a flu and your, your gland comes up, you know. Two weeks later, I finished the album, go see the doctor, and within a week, I'm in front of the oncologist oh and says, yep, there you go. He said, so we're going to get rid of it for you with chemo and radiation and um, sign here. I went, oh, I'll sign up to that. It sounds dramatic. I was stage three. My oncologist said to me, he said, I'd rather have stage three of your cancer than stage one lung cancer. Right, that's right. I went, okay, that yeah. that's puts it into perspective. Yeah. I said, but why? Please tell me. Why me? Well, you know, here I am all like, you know, Mr. Fit and Healthy and running around and doing this. Why me? Is it because is it I, you know, what, is it some karma? Is it because I'm in a bad person? He goes, no, he goes, it's just bad luck. So I had a golf ball in, my, in the Jeez. base of my tongue. I had a three and a half centimeter oh, tumor living there. And I had a two and a half, I had a strawberry uh, growing there. And 33 sessions of radiation and nine weeks of chemo at the same time. It was almost like an out of the body experience because the level of fatigue at the end of it from the radiation was extraordinary, like nothing I'd ever felt before. People I used to ask me, um, were you worried that you wouldn't be able to sing again? I said, well, no, because the first thing was to be alive again. And then the next thing after that is, uh, okay, what can I do? And it's that kind of positive spin on things. Don't say, I can't do X, Y, and Z anymore, therefore I'm all washed up. No, what can you do? That was my attitude as I was doing in, in doing the recovery phase, was don't panic, wait, and just, just wait. And then about, after about 10 months, I was just wandering around, and I felt pretty good wandering around the kitchen at home and nobody there, and I just thought, Let's have a go now. And, and, it, and it, was, it was there. I was like, 
oh my God, it's there. Let, let's have a go at the top notes of Run to the Hills. Oh, oh my God, they're there. It's all there. You know, in fact, some of it was better than it was before. It was so weird. I was prepared to do whatever I could do with my voice um, after it. Nobody loses their voice. They might lose the ability to sing in a particular way, but you never lose a voice. As long as you have something to say, you always have a voice. I love it. The, the, the gloom and doom of some of the lyrics. <laughs> oh yeah, the album's dark. I mean, the comic book is darker still. But you're not like that, so where no, does it I'm come not. from? No, I'm not. It comes from things that have happened to me in my life and things that have happened to other people. A lot of the album is about life and death. And I've had a lot of life and death in my life and potential death and people who have actually died and things. That leaves scars inside. I don't go around wearing my heart on my sleeve telling people about because whatever things have hurt me or hurt other people, um, I own it. I own it. I'm not going to inflict it on other people. It's not, it's not their stuff. It's my stuff. Own it. Get on with the future. Don't live in the past. You know, respect the old days for what they were, but that's not now, is it? Now is like right now. So that's not going to help you right now. And living in the future isn't going to help you right now. Oh, yeah, one day, one day, someday my prince will come. Well, he or she is not here right now. So right now is what's in front of you. Yeah. And, and live, live for right now. I, I don't know if there's a God. I don't know. Uh, I, people want to believe in a God. Fantastic. This life is all you've got. If it's not, it's a bonus. But this life is all you've got. So live it for every day. And life is better than all the other options on the table. What does music do for people? Oh, it can do all kinds of things. It can piss them off. It's going to make them angry. It can make them cry. But what it does is it gives them an escape. If I, if I listen to a piece of music and I'm absorbed in the music, I'm the, the world dissolves around you and you're there. The other thing that music does, which is, I think, unique uh, amongst, I get shot down, somebody else say, oh no, this does it or what that does it. But no, I think music uniquely transports you uh, across time. So for example, things I listened to, you know, when I was 13 or 14 years old, if I listen to that track now, I am 13, 14 years old. I can, I can picture the scene where I was when it was happening. Music is the only thing that does that. That doesn't happen with a movie. You know, it, it doesn't happen with plays. It doesn't happen with books, you know, but music is a, like a direct, it's like a direct plug-in to like the brain of the cosmos that has all of that stuff in it and music can do that. To hear more of this interview, visit our podcast, Life Minute TV on iTunes and all streaming podcast platforms.